Well, I have some bad news. I left the Greensboro area a senior citizen. I'm 50 years old now, and I would come to find out that this disease would have an impact on me right away. I made the journey all the way over to Four Oaks, North Carolina, only to realize that I had changed my reservations and I had overshot my campground by 45 minutes. Apparently, the owners of that park were pretty understanding about this old age disease, and they let me off the hook without a cancellation fee. Okay, if you're ever traveling in the eastern third of North Carolina, like between Raleigh and the coast, just be aware the gas stations are nowhere near the freeways. They're very much off the beaten path. Because if you're not careful, you could end up at some place like Buzzard's Corner where the vultures will just circle and wait for senior citizens and travelers to sort of lose their way. But I finally made it to my little island paradise. I made it. Score one for the old man. I love the simplicity of Cedar Island. You drive onto the island, you drive right to the end of the island, and that's where everything is. You got the campground, the restaurant, uh, the ferry to Ocracoke Island, the stables, and the beach. It's all right there. I can't remember the last time I had an ocean view right from my window. Here I can just wash dishes and see the ocean at the same time. How awesome is that? Not only did I have an ocean view, but on the other side of the camper where my desk is, I'm looking right at the stables. Uh, they actually do uh, horse rides that will take you across a, uh, a stream, I guess, that takes you to another island where there are wild horses running free. In fact, I was sitting at my desk one day looking directly at those stables when I encountered one of the strangest rainstorms in my entire life. Uh, the strangest part about it was I didn't realize what was happening. In fact, uh, I saw the rain hitting the window. I knew it was raining pretty hard, but I didn't realize it was raining sideways because the wind wasn't blowing that hard, or seemingly it wasn't because my trailer wasn't rocking. Next thing you know, it was gushing in through the windows. All the windows on one side of the camper was just gushing in. This storm lasted less than 10 minutes, but the weirdness didn't end there. I went to check on my truck, uh, also with the windows closed, and the rain had gotten all over inside the cab. Just made a complete mess out of things. In fact, the rain actually got into my dashboard and caused the radio to short out. Now, how cool is this? Right here at my campground is the Ocracoke Ferry. It's a two and a half hour ride each way. Uh, you can take your RV for, I think, 30 bucks, uh, one vehicle for 15 And if you just want to walk on, it's $1. The bummer is that as a result of COVID, uh, half the staff is out and there's only one departure a day as opposed to the normal three. Uh, this means if I were to go to Ocracoke Island, uh, I may be there all day and have nothing to do, depending on the precautions they take in the restaurants. My ferry plans came to a screeching halt when I went up to the ticket office to inquire about this, and they were uh, closing until further notice. Their entire staff on shore got COVID. It's been a while since I've talked to a conspiracy theorist, but the last I heard, this pandemic was going away right after the election, but... Um, I keep hearing reports of two or 3,000 dying per day. Maybe we're waiting for Inauguration Day now. I don't know. So I won't be visiting the restaurant here or riding the ferry. That's not going to ruin my fun. I'm a full-time RVer, so now I just get to camp, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right, what the heck is this? This is the pop quiz portion of the show. Simply hit the like button and you'll get the answer at the end of this episode. Is this a loggerhead sea turtle, a leatherback sea turtle, or a mola mola? Okay, you can't Google it because that's cheating, but be sure to hit the like or subscribe button and I'll reveal the answer at the end of this show. Now you may be wondering what else there is to do on Cedar Island. This is pretty much where everything's happening. You have the ocean, the ferry, the campground, uh, the restaurant, the post office is right here. Um, this is pretty much where everything's at. About a block up the road, there's a general store, which is pretty unique. It has a gas station, um, and it feels kind of like a dollar general slash hardware store when you walk in. Other than that, 
provisions are 40 miles away in Moorhead City, so you want to stock up before you get here. In fact, during my six days here, I only left the island one time, uh, so I wandered over to the fishing village of Atlantic, North Carolina, where I felt like I had walked into a scene from Forrest Gump. Of course, these are shrimping boats, as you can see, and uh, some are in better condition than others. I just can't wait any longer. The answer to today's trivia question is the Mola Mola, also known as the Ocean Sunfish. These guys can reach over 2,000 pounds, and I should point out, it's really, really weird looking. Well, I really enjoyed my six days here at Cedar Island, and I could have stayed a lot longer just doing absolutely nothing. Um, I, I really didn't want to leave. I almost got my wish when I got stuck in the mud. I was pretty impressed when my neighbor pulled me out of this with his old F-150, even with my trailer hitched up to the truck. First, I didn't want to leave Cedar Island. Now I arrive here for a one-night stay, and I don't want to leave here either. I'm going to have to find a less desirable campground pretty soon. Of course, I didn't even hesitate to get the fishing rod out. I had a line in the water before I even hooked up my water and electricity. Well, I ran out of daylight pretty quick that night, so I decided to get up super early in the morning and try my hand at fishing again. Uh, it was so early in the morning, I think even the vultures were asleep. Now, if you've been following my channel long enough, you probably know full well I'm a lousy fisherman. I mean, I suck. I'm a terrible, terrible fisherman. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm looking around, and it just doesn't matter. After navigating these narrow lanes through these trees to get to my campsite, it was time to explore. I feel extremely fortunate the past few months. For the past four months, I believe, I've been on a lake or an ocean. I've been camping on the water the entire time. This lake is actually divided up into about six different sections, which are divided by these nice wide paths, which are perfect for running. But sometimes, even with 12 nights at one campground, I'm finding it more and more difficult to get into a good exercise routine. That could be changing very soon as I'm in the process of upgrading my membership to where I can stay in one campground for up to 28 days. I just need this sometimes so I can really get into an exercise routine for at least three weeks at a time. But who needs routine during the holidays? This is how I spent my Christmas Eve in the cold and the dark. A uh, cold front brought in some storms and uh, knocked out the power. Now I should explain that uh, the furnace has never worked in this camper and the previous owner had messed up the wiring to the battery. So I was very much in the cold and the dark. But even though it was only 26 degrees out, I was fine. I was by candlelight, I was under the covers, uh, and even though I didn't get to finish my Christmas movies, hey, I was able to finish my book. Just about the first thing I did in Charleston, and very much on a whim, was take a tour of the Edmonston Alston House. Now up here on the Battery, this isn't even one of the more impressive houses to look at from the street. But what you don't see is that there's two more houses behind it of equal size, if not bigger. The entire function of the second house is to support the first house. This is where the kitchen and the laundry and uh, many of the slave quarters are. Humongous. The house next to that was the carriage house, of which I'm sure they had more than one. These plantation owners like to show off their money a little bit. These days, the carriage house has been converted into a bed and breakfast. Now, I'd like to point out these verandas. Each one of these is big enough to house your 44-foot Class A bus with plenty of room to spare. 
One of the funnest ways to show off your wealth back then was to host parties. And in 1861, these became front row seats to the premiere of the Civil War. And guess who had tickets to this party? None other than the commander of the Confederate Army to fire the first shots on Fort Sumter. He was watching the war from the porch. Well, I guess he was no dummy. That's what you call working smart there. Well, there wasn't a war to watch every night back then, so they would just sometimes have a simple dinner, a 12-course meal that could last up to six hours. Maybe I'm just a simple man, but I can finish this Maya Maya sandwich and hush puppies in less than 20 minutes. It's hard for me to wrap my head around a six-hour dinner, but I can only guess that they were playing poker at the same time. You know, it always blows my mind when I talk to somebody that grew up in Las Vegas uh, uh, and they'll tell me that they haven't been to the Strip in 10 or 20 years because they hate going down there. I mean, it's the truth. Most people don't appreciate what is in their own backyard, which is why I believe more people should travel. So it makes me wonder, if I'd grown up here, would I have developed a bad attitude towards this beautiful place? Yeah, I haven't been to the Battery in 10 years. I just can't stand looking at them houses. They're so obnoxious. And you won't catch me going downtown because of them horse-drawn carriages and uh, all them tourists in the cobblestone streets. No way. I'd rather go to Atlanta and sit in traffic. It's all a matter of perspective, really. Uh, I found the first half of my day in Hilton Head to be a little bit of a letdown after I come from Charleston, which was fantastic. I suppose if I'd come from an Iowa cornfield, Hilton Head would be amazing. Now don't get me wrong, if I had a girlfriend that had a condo here and we spent a few days riding our bicycles on the long bike paths through town, it would be a great time. But for my taste, it just seemed a little too commercial. It was just one long sprawling town with lots of shopping centers and condos. In fact, I was starting to feel like I was going to leave Hilton Head disappointed, but then I actually made a wrong turn on a traffic circle and ended up in Harbor Town. Now Harbor Town is actually in Sea Pines, which is a fee area, and I almost turned around, but something was calling me, and I just wondered if I was going to have a miracle sunset and it would be worth my seven bucks. It would be. Now I'm a poker player, so I like to calculate odds, and I think the odds are that this is Michael Jordan's boat, says Chapel Hill, and he's the legend, right? I know he used to have a home here in Hilton Head. Uh, boy, I'd be really curious to know. What a beautiful boat, though, huh? Well, this looks like a nice time. It could be a very romantic uh, kind of sunset cruise, sip on a glass of wine. You know, if you're into small boats. But if you're a real man's man, you might prefer this ship. The Viking Conquest. Say hello to the legendary Waving Girl. Legend has it that Florence Martis fell in love with a sailor at a young age. The sailor left her, and for decades and decades, as legend has it, she would wave this towel day and night at every passing ship hoping that he would see her. Many sailors brought her gifts, but unfortunately she would still die of a broken heart. After her death, a captain brought in a statue of Martis, and the Savannah, Georgia even offered him payment for the statue, but he refused because of his fond memories of her. When I was in Charleston, I was very impressed with how people conducted themselves and uh, wore their mask and cared about the safety of their fellow human beings. And early in the day, I saw much of the same here in Savannah. 
But as the young party goers came out around three o'clock and started filling the, the streets, it started to feel like a cesspool for the virus, and that was my cue to leave. At times, I feel there are two different groups that don't have a healthy respect for this pandemic. First, there are the conspiracy theorists who actually believe that this is political, which makes no sense, of course, because that means 200 countries would have to be in on it. I mean, maybe my poker math isn't that good, but if the rest of the world has a 3% death rate, but one certain political party here in the U.S. wants to have a half of a percent death rate to be comparable to the flu, well, to me, that just doesn't add up. The second group of people is what I call the Invincibles. Now, the Invincibles are the younger generation that believes it's okay to spread the virus because they themselves are not at risk to die from it. Uh, they may kill their friends' parents, but who's to know, really? In the end, I think most of us will survive COVID and will ultimately look back and see COVID in a million different ways. So the way I understand it, every generation takes its turn at crazy, and humans are resilient. We'll get through this, and we'll all get along again. This too shall pass, and I'm still camping, so it's all good. But I'm not going to lie to you. I'm ready to say goodbye to 2020, just like everyone else is. Please hit the like button if you agree with that, and hit the subscribe button for good luck.